Welcome to Heal Talk Tuesdays with Lisa, where transformation begins as we evoke, embrace, and evolve. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I have time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> greetings, 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 and welcome to Heal Talk Tuesdays. This is Lisa. This is so amazing. Today, I guess, um, well, it is the 13th of the month and anything is possible on the 13th. And today, I, it's not heal talk. In a way, it is. It's going to be healing. It's going to be transformative. But today is Real Talk Tuesdays with Lisa. And my guest is Lynette of La Roche. Allow me to introduce you to Lynette. Hi, Lynette. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Actually, I thank you. Um, I'd like to take a moment and introduce you with a small little bio, and then I'll put your full bio in, sure. uh, in our presentation. <laughs> Lynette is a life architect and founder of the Midlife Redesign Collaborative, which is MRC, which is under the umbrella of this woman's house. It is her mission to empower women to recreate beautiful lives after a major life transition. So Lynette is a life coach, a health coach, hypnotherapist, speaker, four-time best-selling author. And, you know, I want to welcome Lynette. So it's so good to have you and thank you for saying yes. <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> i know we talked about um in the past of who you are where you come from you serving and empowering women that is almost like exactly what i do and my mission is to empower all individuals specifically women and girls for them to stand up for who they are for them to show up just as they are and speak for the things that they believe in. And your mission is so much uh, incongruent with what it is that I share in life. So welcome to the stage, Lynette. So let's start by saying, I've checked your Instagram. We've known each other for a few years. You come from the corporate world and you, you exemplify <laughs> what it is to not only look good, feel good, but to step up for who you are. Mm -hmm. I think that is your mission uh, for women. And you come from the corporate world. So would you please give us a small little story of synopsis of where you come from and where you are today? Well, great. Thank you, Lisa. So yes, um, I spent um, over 25 years in the biotech biopharma industry and had quite a bit of a successful career, um, leaving corporate with um, two drug approvals under my belt. And wow. the only thanks I got was, can you do it again? <laughs> And, um, you know, and then I have a legacy of building peak performing teams where, you know, if you're an inspirational leader, your, your employees, your, your staff, they are more than willing to raise their standard of performance when they feel that you really, you know, embody what they, they expect in a leader and that, you know, you are so very in tune with their development and, and their needs and, and ensuring that they have opportunity as well. And so, but I just got to the point where I just felt like I was, you know, ticking boxes. I was living underneath this facade where everyone else thought, oh, girl, you're so successful. Oh, you have the things. <laughs> and, um, but I wasn't feeling fulfilled. Yeah, I loved helping my team. I love helping them excel, but my career had gotten stagnant. I wasn't going anywhere. But at the same time, I felt like I had- Wait a minute. What do you mean you weren't going anywhere? Don't women, most of us, who start in a business or in the corporate world want to achieve that level of success, isn't that going somewhere? 
Yeah, well, I understand that question. But when I meant I wasn't going anywhere, it was like I was hitting, excelling, exceeding expectations. Mm. But I was not getting the acknowledgement or promotions associated with it. Because, yeah, you want to keep, you know, also climbing that ladder at work. And there were like more layers were being put in between me and what was supposed to be that next step, that next step. So then I ended up being pushed further and further down. So yeah, I'm successful in terms of, you know, leading teams um, because I, I mean, for an example, I had been a remote worker long before the, um, the pandemic and I never used the video, but I built some of the closest um, team members, because my thing is you have to know a bit about each other's projects so that if people had to take holiday, you could cover for them. But I built these amazing teams without ever using a video, but it's about having these interactions with, with teams and, and we'll say it, they want to make me <laughs> proud, but I want them to be proud of themselves. But again, that's what I said about being an inspirational leader. So, and and I fought for my my team. <laughs> I fought for their raises, their bonuses, their opportunities so that they get more experience so that they can get to the next level. But I didn't have anyone doing that same thing for me. And I just mm -hmm. felt like my career wasn't going anywhere. And yeah, you can bounce around to company to company. Um, that's not actually looked upon so badly as it used to be in the past, you know, going from company to company. But again, I just felt like I'd just gotten to the end of the road, um, that there had to be something better for me out there. And so then going through my own life challenges, <laughs> and then that brought me to this special place where I'm the life architect for midlife women 45 to 60. And my mission yeah. is to, <laughs> to just, you know, strip down this veil that we have lived behind, you know, um, where we have sacrificed our own needs for the sake of others. And, um, and I'm here. You mean expectations that are placed upon us? Some women? of them are placed upon us and, and well, what we have allowed to be placed upon us. Others, we take it upon ourselves. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, because, yeah, you know, and, and you may re relate to this in terms of, you know, there is that indoctr indoctrination from a child, you know. So I grew up in a very, very ultra, uber ultra religious environment. So mm -hmm. the way that I dress, the way that I act came from there. <laughs> because there were like a lot of rules that we had to follow. And then I also grew up in the 60s. So there were the rules of girls, you didn't do this. Whereas my brothers, they could do anything they wanted, but True. girls, you can't do this. And so I grew up, you know, always being cognizant of my behavior, you know, always still making sure I fit into that box. The good girl. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the proper, not the good girl. I, I don't like good or bad, proper. Yeah, exactly. Well, there you go. And and I, we used to use that term. I don't think people use that term anymore. Oh, Being she's proper. so proper. I yeah, know, we proper. Used to that. Yeah, it, that used to be a term that we would give to people who had a certain type of presence. We would say, oh my God, they're so proper. Yep. And, um, but... That means they've checked all the boxes. Yeah, they're following they the rules. <laughs> yeah, they're not coloring outside the lines or anything. But as men like women, and again, those of us who are later on in that range of the 45 to 60s, we've just spent so much of our time putting the needs of others ahead of our own. And then we get to this fork in the road where we don't really know ourselves, or even if we had that good career, 
it still may not have been what we really envisaged for ourselves. And so now we're like, well, it's too late for me to do what I want to do now. And as I was saying, my favorite quote by George Eliot was, it's never too late to be who you might have been. And this can be the most brilliant and vibrant and joyful time of our lives. It, we do not have to live less than when we get to this stage in our lives. And the fear that a lot of midlife women feel when they get to this age is because they're like, oh, my looks have gone. Oh, the body may not be what it was like. And then they start feeling invisible to society. And, and I'm here. Feel lost. <laughs> yes. Lost. Like I don't know who I am anymore. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, and then that's when it's like, no, I want to let them, I won't let them let this happen to them. Okay. It's because like I, the spotlight is now on us. We get to define what the spotlight will highlight to the rest of the world. And so you, we- Lynette, do you think that nowadays with all this awareness, uh, what we call self-development, self-realization, mm -hmm. self-empowerment. I mean, this thing about women's empowerment has become the in thing for the last 10 years. I've done women's empowerment, my 3E event that I used to do, mm -hmm. to a point that we are now getting to the point, even the book, Lean In, and Boss Up, those are all words that encourage women to become better, to open up, to speak, and to show up. Um, and yet, there is still that internal, I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to be told that I'm putting myself first. And yet, with all this available, aren't we stepping up more? There is more people going to events of uh, self-development events and doing things for like retreats, for women's retreats, where 20 years ago, that was not heard of. Well, I mean, it's true that there is so much available in terms of resources for all of us. But mm. let me just put something in perspective. Mm. Um, in a study by um, the Inst National Institutes of Health in 2017, at that time, uh, women over 50 comprise over 17.2% of the total population. That's almost 1.4 billion women who are over 50. Yep. But yet, so many of us are still, even with all of these resources, we still have this fear of stepping into our own, putting our own needs first. And so you don't want... It's, 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 it's that fear of judgment too. And so that is one of those Stigma. things that, yeah, you have to work through that. And, and sometimes you just need someone that's going to hold your hand and, and help you through that because it, it is scary to now, after all of this time, whether you raised a family, you've had a spouse, you had this illustrious career or whatever, to now put yourself first. Who is she to be thinking she can put herself first? Right. Who is she to feel that now she can live life, you know, out loud and not worry about like what the world is going to say? Mm -hmm. and, and it comes back to ageism too, because, oh, am I too old mm -hmm. to dress that way? Oh, am I too old to, to be going out with the girls all the time? Am I too old to you know, have this outlook on life. No, and no, and no. You get to define it all. You get to defy it. And, and that's the thing is, I just want this movement of midlife women who are defying stereotypes because stereotype, aging is not a look. It's not like an athletic performance. <laughs> it's not, it's all of these things that are sort of attributed to youth. I mean, because a youthful mindset has nothing to do with age. And I understand I that. So what 
knowing you, I know how competitive you are with yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? And we don't even have to go with saying you're competitive in a corporate world or anything like that. But having that perfect body, the perfect image, the perfect, uh, and I'm not saying perfect for anyone else, but mm. for yourself. Because I think weight and looks and everything one for has to do it for themselves. So when we look in True. the mirror, we say, mm -hmm. I like me. Mm -hmm. We don't have to get to the love part. We can just say, I like me. I like mm -hmm. the way I look. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, how did you overcome your own adversity not to be perfect, but to be I'm good enough today and I like me because mm. you show it on, you show how to dress, how to look, how to take photos, how to be the person in the front of the camera. And not everyone is ready to be on the front camera because they think if I don't have the Botox, if I don't have this, if I don't have the right body. So how do you, how, how can you share that part? Well, it's all about, it's also about building that confidence because, mm -hmm. because yeah, I mean, I was a fanatic in the gym. I, <laughs> in nutrition, I weighed every single thing. I, I ate all the wow. things that I was supposed to, I, I was, I was pummeling myself and I was just like, you, your body has to look this way. And then it didn't happen the way that I wanted it to look. And then when I relax all of these, these standards mm. and my body found its, its way to, I was like, wow, oh, look at that. Like I see muscle separation, like, oh, wow. Like why didn't that happen when I was so serious? It's because when you're trying to achieve something that's outside of you, yeah. You'll never get there. So you have to find that self-acceptance. And I guess that's what it was. I yeah. accept it like, okay, you know, yeah, you know, you have like the, the loose skin. You have like, <laughs> you know, yeah, I call them my swing sets. <laughs> you have like, oh, you know, the teeth that's shifting and there is no perfection. The perfection is, is the beauty that you see in yourself. Mm. That's where the perfection is, is the beauty that you see that you accept about yourself. And that's where it all comes from. Okay. So do you have your own daily or weekly ritual? Well, for me, I start the day with um i listen to hand pan music and you know i have my diffuser going on and i just sort of sit in meditation in the morning before i do anything because okay. it's just really connecting do you wake up at five o'clock in the morning to do this sometimes but most of the time it's around 6 30. okay good <laughs> But yeah, but there were times that I did. I used to work, I used to wake up at 4 30 because wow. because in corporate, I'm on the left coast. And then oh. the company I worked for was in central. But then you also have people in Europe. So I had team members in Europe. So I need to yeah. be on online by six. So yeah, I would get up every day at 4.30. I would have like my morning meditation, my mobility in the morning, and then you deal with the dogs. And then, you know, because I do intermittent fasting, I don't really eat anyways in the morning. So I don't have to worry about food. But, um, but my workout ritual is actually at the end of my day. My workout is what shuts my mind down mm -hmm. because I'm always thinking, next 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 and it just totally just cuts it off and then i don't think about it. i wake up the next morning thinking about all the things that i need to do which is why i need the meditation to like ah stop stop that mind stop that mind so right. yeah um i mean 
we know that the last thing that we place in our subconscious mind right before we go to sleep is exactly what our mind and body does the processing. So that's one of the things I share with my clients. And I'm we're doing the same thing here with the audience. If you were to give uh, the, the tips that I give is when I give my audio recordings for them to relax and unwind. And I mm -hmm. usually say, write five things that you were grateful for just for today. It doesn't matter, no judgment if it went good or bad, just what you were grateful for. And it can be just like, I got up and I drove to work and I did this, just the five things. And just being in the gratefulness mm -hmm. and being mindful of that you were able to, mm -hmm. that's it. So mm -hmm. what are the things that you can share with our audience, especially women between 40s and 60s that are going through the nonstop of I have to achieve, I have to achieve in order for me to have this, that we come back to being a woman, being human? Yes. And so what I like um, and what I do for myself as well, but one of the things that I recommend is, is just what are these little seven, what you may think are small things that happen throughout your day mm. that make you feel good. And whether it's about, about yourself or just gave you like your mind, like a refresh or whatever, but what are these seven little things? Because a lot of times we're so focused on those big picture things that we don't see all the little beautiful things that we've done, mm -hmm. that things that make us happy, or maybe it made someone else happy. What are these seven things that you might feel that were just small, that didn't mean anything, but when you look at them, they either make you smile or it make your heart feel full or whatever, but just sit down and just think about those seven. They can write it down if, if they, they, they want to, but it's about giving yourself grace and appreciation because again, we're just ticking, ticking, ticking and not appreciating. Right. And so, and that's what I like to do is because sometimes you feel like oh, I didn't do anything today. Like I didn't get anything done. And you really have. Actually, one of the smallest little appreciation I can share this. This morning, I went to the bank as I was walking out. Uh, this gentleman, uh, he was like way ahead and he rushed and opened the door for me. And as I walked through, I looked at him and I said, well, thank you. And he says, well, you're welcome. And that in itself is just a, a gesture of appreciation, not only of what he did for me, but for me to even thank him yes. for opening the door. Yes. Uh, you know, I think small little gestures like that, especially as women, when there is that shivery, where there is that grace yes. and um, the word proper. <laughs> the proper etiquette, you know, and I love feeling like this beautiful woman walking through and for someone to open the door. Sometimes as I'm walking out, I hold the door for someone else. And it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. It's just right. proper yes. etiquette. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it's so funny that you will say that because when I was driving to pick up one of the dogs from grooming yesterday, and I just said to myself, okay, Lynette, you have to be nicer on the road. <laughs> you have to be. You, 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 can, you can let these people in front of you, you're all going to get to your destination. Yeah. We're like, why? You know, because growing up in Chicago, it's like, it's such an aggressive driving behavior. And it just stuck with me because if you put your signal on, no one's going to let you in. And you're trying to, even if you're trying to walk, you know, they don't even let you, you, you cross the, they're still like going into the crosswalk while you're trying to walk. And so, and I was like, Lynette, this is a behavior that you have to change. You have to like, you know, 
not be so aggressive on, on the road. Like, yeah, we know you have a need for speed. <laughs> just I feel the need. <laughs> just <laughs> calm down. And 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 then it was just like, and I'm like, I didn't even really think about it. It's like, yeah, you know, so I'm just driving and I'm just like, okay, Lynette, slow down, lift your feet up a little bit. And, <laughs> and you know, because everyone is still trying to get where they need to go help them get there. And that's what I just said, help them get to where they're going. <laughs> that's amazing because one of the things that I have um, done is smile. Mm -hmm. it, 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 they cut me through or something. If you notice when you just not force smile, but it's like, it's okay. When you <laughs> smile, it, it, it creates this rippling effect yeah they may not smile back mm -hmm. but somewhere somehow they may smile for something else and it's this boomerang um when you think about your life growing up i know it was i grew up in a very um my god there was a time that i used to say my life was very much gestapo everything was rules <laughs> But the best time and the worst time when you, where you are right now, what experience in your life has set you on a different path than, than in the past? And yet now that you look back, you appreciate. Mm. Well, again, just like you, I grew up in a very strict house. Not only was it the Bible, but my parents were just naturally strict. And then, mm -hmm. you know, girls, again, we weren't allowed to do like all the things that my brothers could. And they were outnumbered. It was seven girls to two boys. And Wow. Uh, yeah, I'm number seven of nine. And um, no wonder you like seven. <laughs> And, um, and so, but for me, it was learning to define what greatness or success meant because mm -hmm. I was one of those, I loved school. <laughs> I loved school. And back, I don't, you know, back then, it was, you know, all the kids, they just wanted to get the top grades. You know, you wanted to see your score at the end of every school year. And so, um, and I would always bring home these great grades. But again, you know, growing up in the working class family who didn't, you know, pursue, uh, pursue like higher education outside of high school, it was like, you. I never really felt that, I was successful because I never got like those accolades, like, oh my God, Lynette, you did so wonderful. So I always mm. had trouble seeing when I did something really great or, or what was success. And so, and, and then one of the things that I learned, and actually it was probably within the last five years, <laughs> was making, having my own definition of success mm. for myself. Something where I can say, Lynette, you did it, girl. And exactly. <laughs> and and that really relaxed me because no matter how great I did things, I will always see like the three things that I could have did better and mm -hmm. not the 97 things that were almost perfect. You know, and I was always focused on, oh, I could because I didn't have the measuring stick. So I had to make my own. And then so what is the measuring stick now? I mean, because for every single person, success is something different. Someone exactly. the house, the blinks, the travels, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. uh, the Hermes purse, you know, everybody mm -hmm. has a <laughs> everybody has a measuring. For someone, it's a happy home, happy family, and they are very to to them uh, that that home with the garden and mm. having this beautiful flourishing blossoming garden mm. is like i'm happy 
So for me, success means that at the end of each day, am I confident that I did my best? And, and you would just be amazed at, because it involves so many other things. It involves appreciating yourself. It involves giving yourself grace. It involves honoring yourself because, you know, again, so much, we're just out here just churning out like all of these things. And, and which is why I say like those little things that you don't even think about that's making you feel good because you're so caught up thinking and, and only looking at these big things. And it's kind of hard to make you, for you to feel good about yourself because right. you're like, God, I only, only chipped off a piece of that project. Oh, I didn't finish my website. And, <laughs> and, and that's what I think like at the end of every day, do I feel that I did my best? Because that is what makes me feel really good. Like, I didn't like screw up everything. <laughs> that was good enough. And that's one of the things good enough is good enough. Well, and I mean, I, I, actually, I don't even, even like that term. I think in the past, good enough? I get, I, it depends. So if you, if you have totally no self-worth, then getting to the point of good enough, I, I accept that. Yeah. But you want to be excellent enough. You mm. want to be exceptional enough in your own definition of it, because good enough still seems like you're lacking. And it still sort of feel like there is some lack that, oh, right. well, you didn't even try to go up here and you just like, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> like, like, yeah, like I just wrote this, just, this article, yeah, I could have ran it through like Grammarly, but oh, that's good enough. <laughs> so, <No. laughs> and so, but again, it's, it's all, I think it all comes back to when, when you are, and that's the thing is we need to stop de putting definitions and on everything. So if we come back to, do you feel that you're doing your best? Then That's you good. know that you're everything. Okay. You're everything. So, my dear audience, you are everything. Yes. When you look yourself in the mirror and you just smile. And I love your smile. Look at that bright smile. Oh, gosh. I feel like I have like that little Clint Eastwood sort of crooked smile. I like it. <laughs> well, I have this small little, uh, it's not, a, uh, I had this growth from growing up and it used to be huge and it, it was uh, blue and they took me to Germany to decolorize it and it left a scar. So oh. eventually it, it weighed, uh, it, it went away, but I still have that scar. And you know what? For the longest time when I was growing up, I felt like everyone is staring at me, the way my mouth is crooked. The, and, and it's just like, you know what? Get over it. This is it. This is how I was born. This is the best, <laughs> you no know? One, and no I'm, I'm happy symmetrical. with who I am. <laughs> no <laughs> one is symmetrical. I mean, like <laughs> one of my ears is a little higher than the other. <laughs> So my glasses are being lopsided. So whatever. I'm everything. <laughs> you know, this is why I love this conversation. It's, it's just beautiful appreciating this moment. And I truly appreciate this moment because we were on a call, on our group call about, mm -hmm. what, 10 days ago? a week ago and something just triggered and I said, Lynette, do you want to be my guest? And she's like, when? I said, Tuesday. She's like, let me check. Okay. And 
<laughs> that that is this is what good energy is. This is what friendship is. This is yes. what sharing to not only of who we are. And we've talked about so many things are good and the bad and the struggles we've had in the last two years. And thanks to the group that we belong to and the women in that group yes. that we challenge each other, we support one another. And I think this is this is your mission and my mission. And I thank you for this because this is what I look for. Others who are here to support, encourage, empower and yes. uplift one another. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yes. And, so, and you've been so powerful in that space. So, you know, we just need more. And as who we the person who encouraged you, who is the woman either? Um, and I was going to say think fictional or not, but someone you looked up to who mentored you or became the person that you said, I want a glimpse of that. And that's the great idea. I think it actually came from out of community. Mm. You know, again, finding a community of women and there wasn't one specific woman, but I snatched a piece of each one of these women and I was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. And, and I brought it to myself because again, you know, it's, it's about being your best. And sometimes someone that you meet has that, that piece mm. that is, you know, here it is. It, it went right there, you know, and oh, oh, here, <laughs> right there on the shoulder blades. And, and, and yeah, I just feel that I'm just been really blessed because I met some like you, some remarkable women that have just really given me a way to continue to shore up myself so that I'm able to be this this voice, this this architect for the women that I work with. And and I and again, it's just this amazing community of women who have been able to give me some of their power, whether they knew it or not, that to help me to bring it all together. Did you watch the Olympics? Some of it. Okay. I want to say I was so ecstatic. I was glued to the Olympics mm -hmm. after work uh, on weekends. And the practice, mm -hmm. the, the, the effort that goes into getting to that level mm -hmm. of expertise and then and then just realizing, because Nadal was talking about this, and he said, realizing that even though it looks flawless on the court, it took years of losing, mm -hmm. it took mm -hmm. years of mental aptitude to realize the other opponent is feeling unsure, and yet as tenacity and going to get because they want that one serve. And to get to that level of knowing at L any level that we mm -hmm. excel in to be the best, we must find that humbleness to know another person can beat me at any moment. Yes. And it's just a game. It's not who I am. Exactly. I love that. And, and that is so true, which I feel is applicable again, to midlife women is because all of your years and decades of experience that brought you here to now, it hasn't expired. Now you get to use that to propel you for in, in like the best life that you could ever imagine. And, and there's nothing anyone out there that can take away from you. So all of this work, all of this practice that they have put in creating this life, they can do it again and make it exceptional. That's beautiful. I know your uh, your time is very valuable, and uh, you are in San Francisco. You're going to be transitioning somewhere else, but you're always available online yes. and reachable. So, would you please share with our audience where they can find you? 
Well, they can definitely reach me at um, on I IG, Instagram, at Lynette LaRoche, L-Y-N-N-E-T-T-E-L-A-R-O-C-H-E. And it's important that there's two N's in Lynette or you will find me. <laughs> and, you know, they can reach out. And so whether they comment on your posts and, and they reach me that way, um, I'm more than happy to meet Definitely. I'm going to be sharing all your information and link and everything. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so yes. much, Lisa. I, I thank you. It. And I look forward to our next uh, meet in person. And yes. hopefully one day we might even share a stage together, my dear. Yes, that would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you so much for being here and thank you. my audience thank you so much for taking your time and i hope this was beneficial to you it gave you one uh, glimpse one message one idea of how to know that you matter yes no matter where you are in life Yes. With that, absolutely. God bless you all and may the universal light surround you always. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. And if you like this, share it, subscribe, and go to YouTube and you'll see the rest of all my podcasts.